lovely to meet you all from uh, here in my home in Australia uh, and talk about the work which is inextricably linked to the future of education. The one thing out of COVID-19 that maybe is good is it has shown that education can change. It can change quickly. But the question I want to ask is, can it change for the better? Pre-pandemic, it was clear to me that higher education was going to change, but everything that was happening is now accelerated. And from my perspective, trying to run a university, I asked the question, can we navigate this current chaos to create a system that is better for all without the potential alternative of fragmentation where it wins entirely on who you are and where you live? So I see the digital world as both an opportunity and a threat to equality and inclusivity. And let me unabashedly say that a good future, the one I think we're ho hopefully striving for is one that includes as many of the world's population as possible and which allows one's pathway to be based on talent and ambition, not social, cultural, economic factors. The opportunity arises from the digital world connecting essentially every person on the planet to global opportunities. So for example, one of our previous speakers, Chris Pissaratis, another uh, a Nobel laureate, but in economics I met, where we were looking at how the Alibaba platform in China was essentially allowing people anywhere to create companies and sell products anywhere in a way that completely defied the normal constraints of our economy and class and capital. So one can imagine that this same type of digital platform, whether it be Alibaba or anything else, could allow anyone in Africa to create companies to do almost anything connected to the global world. That is a huge opportunity. Online uh, platforms can deliver education on almost any topic to anyone with an internet connection. And while I realize internet connections are not ubiquitous, even here in Australia, uh, they are becoming so, and hopefully one will be available to almost anyone in the distant future. But I also see that there is a threshold in this digital world, a threshold where a person either is equipped to make use of the technology and amplify their talents with the technology, or where the technology completely displaces their ability to be meaningfully productive. Now that threshold depends a bit on the state of the society you live in, your socioeconomic, cultural, educational status within that society, your talents and ambition. And above that threshold, you thrive, and below it, you, you don't. The future of work is for those who are above that threshold. And the great equalizer to get as many people above that threshold, I believe, is education. Education for the future of work, therefore, needs to connect into the entirety of society. Everyone is going to need to get an education and training as an ongoing part of their lives. And so this means we're gonna to need to have on-ramps for people into, for example, the higher education system, including those who have not been part of it in the past. And we need to find ways to educate people later in life in the skills they need so that they can add to their repertoire. But we need to do it in a way which also fits in the lives of people's jobs and their families. So this doesn't mean our university physical campuses are going away. Young students benefit from the opportunity to mature as they grow their skills alongside a cohort of other students. People in short courses or as part of longer digitally delivered courses will also benefit from people who have intensive experiences with experts and equipment on our campuses. Some universities may choose to be entirely digital while others will specialize in specific areas and activities. The future of higher education will need to cover a whole range of things from the vocational side all the way up to research PhDs. And a good future system will include interoperability where people are able to traverse from all sorts of backgrounds through the system as part of their lifetime education journey. A bad system will remain fragmented and perhaps even fragment more with the different silos differentiated largely 
by the amount of social economic advantage a person has. That's a bad system. So there are both opportunities and uh, with the massification of education, but risk. Learning to learn takes time. Relationships are important. And while massification is an important part of an ecosystem to bring people up from all walks of life and a better education to everyone that way, that interoperability is critical to give everyone a chance to do what their talents and ambitions allow. And there's a risk. People bypassing the foundational education they need in favor of short learning as you go training. This process that reacts to the short-term opportunities but has the potential to ultimately limit a person's lifetime productivity if done without thought. If you learn just what you need to do for a certain job, you may never get the mathematical or the writing communication or critical thinking skills you need to do a job that is much more complex. These skills, while not impossible to gain when you are older, do require a lot of time to gain, thousands of hours. And then you need to have that focus to be achieved. And so there's a reason why most people get educated when they're young, rather than an, on a need to know basis as they, as they age. Lifetime opportunities are gonna be essential. We cannot assume what you learned as a young adult will be sufficient for a 50 year career. So the future of education is gonna to need to allow people to reset their education in some, ties, some cases, and for most, continually update it. The current research-led university ecosystem is potentially under threat as research, education, and training, now connected, become disconnected from each other. What is the future of this ecosystem in a political world focused on the very short term, favoring training over education, and kind of putting research-led education to the side. In this world, we may well lose many of our research-intensive universities, which are key to delivering much of the research of the world. And there are the key gateways for people from all sorts of background to use exceptional talents to make key discoveries that benefit the world. A loss of these institutions, for example, the conversion of most state-run institutions into high-volume degree-only institutions, will leave only a small research, small set of research universities, which I fear will once again just become the bastion of the elite. So in summary, the opportunities are there for education to empower most of the citizenry of the world to tame technology and use it to increase their productivity. And in this utopic figure uh, future, we need uh, the talent of the world uh, engaged in creating this prosperous and sustainable future. That's a great opportunity. The dystopic alternative where the system fragments and only the privileged get the education and ability to augment their abilities with technologies is one where we're almost certainly not be able to live sustainably on the planet and where the vast fraction of the world's population is left behind. So even in the utopic system, some people will be left behind and we'll need to look after them. And I think it's really key that we have a system that allows whatever caused a given person not to cope with this new world, it doesn't transfer on to their families, to their friends or the community. So we get intergenerational advantage. And so the system needs to be resilient. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much for that compelling introduction to this session, Brian. Um, we, uh, ladies and gentlemen, those who have just joined us, we have been asked to examine in this uh, session the following question. In the context of a rapidly changing world, facing increasingly complex problems and also a world of work that is characterized by a rapidly increasing deployment of technology, artificial intelligence, cloud computing, digital skills and digital mobility, question is, does higher education need to change and how should it change? Now, Brian has already given us an indication of how he thinks it needs to change. Ava has just joined us. Ava has joined us from, the, from Murdoch University. And I'm going to give her the opportunity to respond. And then I'll get back to, to pose one or two questions to Brian about his presentation. Good morning, Ava. Good morning. Good um, afternoon. Well, good evening from me. From oh, I should have said good day. <laughs> no, no worries at all. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity and what a privilege it is to be part of a, a noble um, prize dialogue. You know, um, that's, that's an incredible uh, opportunity and privilege. And thank you, Brian, for your 
for your opening remarks. So does higher education need to change? I wanted to, first of all, just think about the fact that higher education is a dynamic construct. It is influenced by environment within which it exists. And of course, um, it also itself shapes the society that is part of. So it can do nothing but change. And the question I think we're probably exploring here is that um, because of the current technological advances, you already talked about that, Norman, societal, political, economic, etc., changes, um, what are the, the parts of higher education that are most rapidly changing at the moment? Brian talked about the fact that the pandemic has already uh, really accelerated change in higher education in, in many different ways. And the obvious example that Brian mentioned was um, the online learning. I've been in higher education for a very long time and I was a Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic in a few universities prior to coming to Australia and it's quite remarkable how for many years I, I was trying to implement strategies for technology advanced learning and some of them were more, more successful than others and I sort of witnessed in 2020 an acceleration of, of uptake of online learning that I, it had taken me maybe five in previous lives. So the consequences of that, for instance, for our staff have been quite dramatic. You know, having to adapt and acquire new skills and teach differently and engage differently. And, you know, I have to say that I'm very uh, appreciative as a vice chancellor of the university, but also very impressed uh, by the way in which our staff have adopted. Brian talked about the world of work, world of work and of in that, that, that required us to adapt our curriculum and be relevant and be um, really forward looking. And um, the importance to learn how to learn, but also how to, to and how to relearn again. And doing that, acquiring some of those basic skills of learning relearning again as a student so that you are, when you go into the work to have this uh, set of skills for you to, to work with. And workforce, of course, we were just talking, and Brian mentioned this as well, is, is changing very dramatically. Technological advances, we don't know what the uh, technology will bring and, and so on and so forth. So one of the things that we all need to be focusing on and we are increasingly focusing on and actually the Australian government is encouraging us in universities to be involved in this is reskilling, upskilling and skilling the current workforce. And the kinds of models that we are looking here are blended and on-learn, but also accelerated and block models. And also what we talk, uh, talk about is micro-credentialing. This is a bit like build a bear model, i.e. you take parts of learning that are relevant to you, to your work at this point in time, and they're bespoke to you in the sense that those are the parts that you believe you need to learn, and you build your own degree or your qualification. And then very finally, I just wanted to comment on that, um, what Brian talked about is that, uh, you know, education uh, is an equaliser, and it always has been. And through technology and through um, reaching out to uh, people who may not usually benefit from higher education or education at any level is something that we need to take very seriously and are taking very seriously as universities and educational institutions. And, and that is, you know, being, bringing education to all who can benefit irrespective of background is an important mandate for all universities. I stopped there because I know we only have 15 minutes, Norman, but I could say more and I'm very happy to add anything that you'd like me to add.
Thanks a lot, Ava. Unfortunately, in fact, our time has been reduced to 10 minutes, um, so I'm going to cram in okay. as many questions as I possibly can. Uh, Brian, um, you had indicated in your presentation and something that I had written and which I had seen, uh, you indicate that significantly increasing access to higher education will become increasingly possible given the affordances of educational technologies. However, you all also argue that this could be accompanied by certain risks. Uh, won't you briefly explain what these potential risks are? And, and perhaps if you could look at, I think, the, the issue that you raise about training overriding education. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, the gig economy type attitude of education means you just learn what you need for a given job, but you can then commoditize the education. And if you're going to just do really short, sharp training, why have universities at all? Are we just going to be doing the training that companies need? Why won't they disintermediate us and just do it for us? And we could easily see universities being squeezed out of the education market. Now, I think there'll be a big consequence for society because that's really short training and people won't get that deep learning, learning to learn that will allow them to do much more complex things. That's where you've got research trained people teaching. You can bring people up to the cutting edge. So you move society forward rather than just getting people into the jobs of today. So I think that's the risk is us getting squeezed by really being short for thinking. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, Ava, back to you. Um, I formulated the question before we started, uh, which I thought I was going to ask you. What to your mind are the key actual or potential impediments to universities recalibrating in ways that will ensure that their graduates are optimally equipped to actualize themselves or thrive in the future world of work? I think Brian actually has articulated one of the sort of key um, maybe impediments or risks that we need to be very mindful of, of is we need to be clear what universities are, what is our purpose. I personally believe in something called an educated mind, an educated mind being an equalizer in society. And educated mind is not an instrumentalist view of education. It is not there for a purpose that because I do this particular piece of learning, I will get this particular job here. It's a much broader concept and is something that I think universities need to really reinstate their purpose. That is the purpose of a university. And because you have an educated mind, you then have an educated society. So one of the risks, of course, is that not everybody will have access to education to in any form of education, including higher education. And that is, I think, that we need to absolutely be focused on, that technology enables that access, but also access through funding. You know, one of the most incredible things in, in Australia is, and in the UK, is the loan system for students. So you're not actually, your access to higher education is not impeded by your ability to pay. So you actually are given uh, funding to be educated in the university context. So there's just a couple of points. I'm mindful of time, Norman. Thank you so much, Ava, for that response. And Brian, also for your earlier responses. Um, they were usually helpful, I'm sure, to, to colleagues in the academy. Um, who are all, I suppose, wondering how we will prepare our students best um, for the future world of work. Now, I've got several more questions that I would have liked to pose to you, but unfortunately, our time has, has run out. And so now I'm going to hand over to the, to the uh, program director. Thanks a lot, Brian. Thank you very much, Ava.